Hello, I'm Brian Bankson with the Cinco Ranch Branch Library, and welcome to episode three of What Makes This Photograph Great, where we analyze point by point, element by element, pixel by pixel, what makes a photograph worth looking at. Each episode I'll be choosing a master photographer and focus on a particular photograph from their repertoire that I really dig. Today, we're going to look at American landscape photographer Ansel Adams. Let's start with a little background on Mr. Adams. He was born in 1902 in Northern California. At an early age, he became interested in astronomy, using his father's three-inch telescope to peer at the heavens. At the age of 14, Adams first visited Yosemite National Park with his family. He wrote of his first view of the valley. The splendor of Yosemite burst upon us, and it was glorious. One wonder after another descended upon us. There was white everywhere. A new era began for me. At age 17, Adams joined the Sierra Club, a group dedicated to protecting the wild places of the earth, and he was hired as the summer caretaker of the Sierra Club visitor facility in Yosemite Valley. It was here that he would start his photography career. His first photographs were published in 1921. During the mid-1920s, the fashion in photography was pictorialism, which strove to imitate paintings with soft focus, diffused light, and other techniques. You see, photography was still new as an art form, and as yet wasn't accepted by the art world as a legitimate form of art. So many photographers like Alfred Stieglitz and Edward Steichen would use photographic techniques to try and mimic the look and feel of paintings. Here are a few examples. They thought that the only way photography would be accepted as an art is if it mimicked other art forms. Adams experimented with such techniques, but by 1925 he had rejected pictorialism altogether for a more realistic approach that relied on sharp focus, heightened contrast, precise exposure, and darkroom craftsmanship. He called this pure photography. By the 1930s, he had formed a photography collective called Group F64, which is named after a very small aperture setting that creates sharp focus and a wide depth of field. Group members included Edward Weston and Imogen Cunningham. The group espoused pure photography over pictorialism. The group's manifesto say, stated, Pure photography is defined as possessing no qualities of technique, composition, or idea derivative of any other art form. This led to the modernist photography movement, which believed that photography, as an art form, should play to its strengths and do what no other medium could do, accurately capture and document reality. Ansel Adams' contributions to photography, both as an art form and a craft, are immense. His huge archive of photographs of the American West is a national treasure. His forming of Group F64 set photography on a modernist art path. He created the zone system to help photographers determine how the film must be exposed and developed to achieve the desired brightness or darkness. Adams helped establish the photography department at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the first major American museum to recognize photography as an art form. And finally, Ansel Adams worked tirelessly to raise awareness for conservation and environmental protection. In his autobiography, Adams expressed his concern about Americans', Americans loss of connection to nature in the course of industrialization and the exploitation of the land's natural resources. He stated, We all know the tragedy of the dust bowls, the cruel, unforgivable erosions of the soil, the depletion of fish or game, and the shrinking of the noble forests. And we know that such catastrophes shrivel the spirit of the people. The wilderness is pushed back. Man is everywhere. Solitude, so vital to the individual man, is almost nowhere. So now, let's take a look at the photograph I have chosen to critique. The photograph I have chosen is entitled Clearing Winter Storm, and it was taken by Ansel Adams at Yosemite National Park in California in 1937. Now, I chose this picture because it's one of my favorites of Ansel Adams. Uh, um, 
let's start with talking about the sharpness of it, because that's what he's known for, for his is a group F64 where he uh, took these pictures usually with an 8x10 film camera and um, has a very small aperture that makes everything just nice crisp and sharp and this photo is definitely sharp as a tack. Uh, you'll see everything you know from the trees in the foreground to the mountains right here to this more distant mountains that of course decrease in contrast as he move away from the lens um, all in definite sharp focus. Uh, what's, um, now another thing I really love about this picture is what we call the dynamic range. And dynamic range is, is, is talking about how the range of tones in the photograph. Uh, now this is a, a black and white photograph, so the only tones you're going to have are going to go from black to white with all the different shades of gray in the middle. Now a good photograph um, is one that has uh, a high dynamic range of lots and lots of tones, starting with you know black blacks and looking at this photo right you know right here you definitely see some black blacks that definitely verge on black, um, and then you also have you know white whites, uh, and you, about here it looks like the brightest part of the picture. Uh, with this waterfall here, the snow on the ground here, looks to be the closest thing we have to, to, to true white whites. Um, but also just the luscious shades of gray all throughout. All these trees right here, uh, different shades of grays. You go, this mountain here is a dark, dark mountain, but because of the distance from the camera and the the clouds and the fog, you know, it's a nice, nice shade of gray. You got all these grays here in the clouds. Um, and then more towards the edge, you have more dark black blacks, um, start, starting to verge somewhat on whites, you know, right around here in this area. Uh, this photograph, I think, is is one of the the best that I've seen in terms of dynamic range, and maybe that's why I do like it this much. Um, we can talk about composition um, a little bit. Um, you can definitely see this waterfall here. It falls in, you know, right about the, the right third of the photograph. Uh, you can see this third of the photograph is kind of dominated by by this mountain right here. Uh, I'm going to talk about balance. Uh, in photography, balance in photography, uh, you're talking mainly about the distribution of visual weight uh, in the photograph. You want to have, I guess we would call an even distribution of visual weight. And many things can add visual weight to a, a photograph. Um, in black and white photo photography, that's mainly just the, the different tones in the picture, uh, which we had talked about earlier. Uh, so having a good balance, you know, of, so right over here, you know, on this side, you have a nice real, you know, big area that, you know, is probably the brightest area uh, of the photograph. You know, counterbalance over here with this dark, dark rock and these dark rocks here. Um, and then over here, you know, this area right here, you know, you have, it starts to, doesn't really verge on white, white, but it's definitely, you know, a brighter area over here. It counterbalanced by this very similar shaped area right here of, of definite, you know, dark, um, dark, dark areas. Um, we can talk about leading lines. I don't know if it really applies too much in this photograph. Uh, most of the lines you're going to see um, are, are going to come from the trees and they're all kind of pointing upwards, uh, which is kind of, I guess you would call like God's natural leading lines of uh, these are almost like arrows pointing upwards. Um, and that's where most of the lines come from. You have some nice uh, diagonals coming down here, 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 kind of all just kind of meandering towards the center of the, the photograph. Um, now let's talk about, um, you know, one of the problems with nature or landscape photography is 
identifying the subject of the photograph. Uh, I think most nature photographers would tell you that nature is the, the subject of the photograph. Uh, that the whole picture, uh, the subject encompasses the whole picture, um, which is kind of a, a no-no in photography terms. Uh, there should be a definite subject that you could point to somewhere in the picture and say, this, this right here is the subject. Uh, and it tends to get lost in a lot of landscape photography. Um, and it tends to cause what I call bad landscape photography or what you would call, say, postcard photography. Uh, not to say there's anything wrong with a lot of the pictures you see on postcards, but, uh, you know, the really good landscape photography will definitely have subjects, you know, either a subject or multiple subjects, things that just pull your eye into the picture. Um, and this one, uh, the waterfall, uh, and it's, I love it because it's, it's, you know, usually when you take pictures of waterfalls, they are just, you know, close up and grand and they take up most of the picture. And this one takes up, you know, just kind of a, a tiny portion where you can kind of just barely see it, but it's there and it's still majestic. Uh, um, I really, I really, I really dig that part of, of this, um, this photograph. Um, this rock here is almost a subject in itself. Uh, it's just this kind of dark, mysterious rock that's, you know, in, in the middle of this haze of the clouds. Uh, it looks, it looks very ominous. Uh, it looks like if this was, you know, a fantasy like Lord of the Rings, this is where the bad wizard would live. Uh, um, I really, I really dig, you know, and the, having both of those things kind of right kind of in the same vicinity, you know, across the picture from each other, uh, uh, that balance as well, I think, is, is one of the reasons I really, really like this picture. Uh, um, lastly, we're going to talk about something called the sublime. Um, now, sublime is mainly talked about in reference to paintings, uh, and I'll show you a few paintings, uh, uh, but mainly by William Turner, uh, that that you know are, are kind of dedicated to the idea of the sublime. Um, first, let me kind of explain what it is, and it's a difficult philosophical term to describe. Uh, my favorite way to describe the concept of the sublime is. A feeling of a feeling of awe, a feeling of exhilaration, and a feeling of terror, all at the same time. Um, let me show you so a couple of these paintings. You know, like there's this painting by William Turner of uh, he did a lot of these kind of storms at sea with these waves that would just you know dwarf the the boat, and you would just see the, like the awesome awe inspire terror of, of that nature can can do uh, same with this one this one's called uh, Hannibal and his army crossing the Alps uh, you know the people are so small uh, compared with all the rest of the nature the, the this devastating nature you know these these mountains that just you know jut out of the earth and you know the storm what looks like almost like a tsunami of a storm coming to so just lay waste to this, you know, this, this army crossing the Alps. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the feeling of the sublime, some people say that a painting or a piece of art that, you know, you know, shows something sublime, you know, causes that same feeling you get in the pit of your stomach as you're about to, to, to go over the top of the big crest of the roller coaster, just that feeling of exhilaration and terror at the same time. Um, you mostly at the, you know, the majesty and uh, uh, just awe-inspiring terror of, of nature itself, you know. If you look back, you know, at this, you know, this painting, or the, the photograph of Ansel Adams, the, the I mean, these mountains are they're beautiful. Um, and, and sublime usually does always, you know, encompass the beautiful, but they're also uh, terrifying in a way, just the way that, you know, that this nature just, you know, dwarfs, you know, anything that's on the scale of man. Uh, they're just huge, and the raw power it took for these rocks to just, you know, jut out of the earth uh, like this, uh, 
that's what I, you know, really gives it the, the, the power of the sublime, in my opinion. Uh, and this, you know, and Ansel Adams was, you know, his thing was nature. Uh, and I believe, I, you know, I don't know how much he would actually like me comparing his work to paintings, given that he wasn't uh, definitely against pictorialism, but I think he would appreciate uh, showing how his photographs, you know, just demonstrate the, you know, exhilaration, the awe, and even the terror of nature. Thank you for watching this month's episode on uh, the photography of Ansel Adams. If you're interested to uh, look at more of his photographs, we have this book, 400 Photographs by Ansel Adams, here at the Fort Bend County's Library that you can check out. And stay tuned next month, uh, we'll be discussing American portrait photographer Annie Leibowitz. Thank y'all, have a great day, and keep shooting. Mm -hmm.